guys, this is Demetrius, and you're probably wondering what in the world does a beer stein, a moose, a submarine and sailboat, and a hat have to do with park design? Well, I'm going to tell you. It's accessibility. Now, uh, we've discussed accessibility uh, in, through a variety of means, and I'm actually going to go into a little detail on something else. Uh, but first off, when you're talking about accessibility, you need to be able to actually get to the place where it's whatever site or park that you're visiting. And uh, early in the semester, I talked about visiting the Shiner Brewery or the Spetzel Brewery in Shiner, Texas. And every time I go there, I pick up one of some kind of little memento just so, you know, hey, I remember I've been there. Okay. Well, this past time, I didn't actually pick this up, um, but I alluded to it in class and I talked about the access to the parking lot which seems like a minor detail because you would think that any place that wants to have people would have a fairly decent uh, parking area. Well, in the case of the Spetzel Brewery, which is actually a historic landmark, uh, it's uh, a fairly small building and the parking facilities were pretty inadequate for the amount of tours that they were doing on a weekly basis. So they it has expanded, but it's just not to the degree they need to. However, the site, because of the size, which is rather small, has several limitations. There's a creek, there's obviously the new building, and there's new construction and a major highway. So how are they going to get around that? That's part of their master plan, I would hope, which uh, every good site, whether it's a business or a recreation destination, should have. Well, getting on to a more serious note, in several of the class lectures, we talked about, well, the natural world, and one of those things that can affect an experience in parks are animals. Uh, and we use the example of uh, birds in several parks, uh, including cleaning up uh, Millennium Park with that the, the giant cloud or bean, and uh, how basically bird poop is <laughs> pretty, pretty disgusting and can lead to uh, several unpleasant situations, uh, such as how they have to cover the Great Lawn and all these other aspects. Well, in the case of moose, I lived in Alaska for three years. Moose are fairly common up there, as you can imagine, and they are actually quite a bit of a nuisance. And they will certainly deny you access to uh, places you want to visit. In this case, they can block your car. <laughs> Be in the middle of the roadway, which is doesn't sound too big, but if you're in, say, a national park or a state park where there are considerable distances and you need to drive between various sites and overlooks and that kind of thing, well, that's going to be a problem. Additionally, wildlife can become angry. Uh, I've personally seen a moose charge at a car uh, granted, the people who were in that vehicle were not acting uh, as proper stewards of the environment, but needless to say, the moose did charge them, and they were very lucky to escape injury. But it's just another thing to keep aware of that even when you're going to visit nature, sometimes nature may not necessarily want you there. So that is one thing. And now... You're probably wondering, how in the world is a submarine and a sailboat come to mind? Well, I don't know how many of y'all have visited Galveston, but they have uh, several historic ships and historic buildings, of course, uh, both on the Strand and throughout the island that uh, survived the storm of 1900 and a few other things. But they do have a submarine on uh, Pelican Island uh, down from the A&M Galveston campus, and it's the uh, USS Kavala, which sank a uh, Japanese aircraft carrier and a few other things. And they also have the sailing ship Alyssa, which does not look like this, but it's only a sailing ship I just happen to have. Uh, one thing that uh, a lot of people don't realize when it comes to these storage ships is they don't necessarily think about people with disabilities. And that has actually been, we discussed the Americans with Disability Act um, in class. And one of the ways that our one of the few exemptions that's given, given are for historic structures. And now, there's a caveat with that. If there are certain modifications that are made to the site, or in this case, to the ships or structure, then 
accommodations for the handicap have to be made none, uh, regardless of the historic nature of it. And that's a very long topic and gets into uh, handicap rights in the United States. But basically, when it comes to these, ships have a lot of small hatches and ladders, which are not particularly suited for dealing with people, say, in uh, wheelchairs. Uh, we discussed access in particular with real wheelchairs and even to some degree uh, horses, which is not a concern here. But uh, with wheelchairs, uh, certain ships, I've done some research on this, and it turns out that they do make accommodations and they will add like small one-person lifts into uh, certain portions of the ship. The entire ship is still not accessible due to you know, design characteristics of how a ship is built, but it does allow more people to have access than normally would happen. They also provide uh, audio and visual, visual tours using uh, modern uh, multimedia. And of course, the, with the internet, you can tour a lot of these sites uh, 24 hours a day just online and get a fairly good experience. Unfortunately, as we've discussed in class, you don't get some of the things like the sights and the smells and you don't get the touch, which especially when you're talking about a ship, you're usually near a large body of water. In this case, in Galveston, you're going to be near salt water. And it, just the smells and the sights of being in a port are pretty, it kind of puts you in the proper mindset. While, whereas watching a video on YouTube, may not have the same effect. Finally, this hat. I actually received this hat uh, during an RPTS 49 class, uh, which was taught by Mr. Wald Dabney, uh, amazing person and just an absolutely incredible instructor and just a great person all around. But aside from that, this is about the Texas Outdoor Family Program. Uh, basically, they take people who may otherwise be a little apprehensive about going into nature. So they may be from an inner city or they may be from, say, a parent, family with parents that have never really camped and are kind of embarrassed possibly by their lack of knowledge about the outdoors. So they provide people with knowledgeable instructors who are members of Texas Parks and Wildlife, and they set them up and they go out for these camping trips in various parks across the state. Uh, it's an amazing program, and if you haven't heard of it, I would highly suggest taking a part of it or even becoming a part, maybe even a member of it. it. I had a friend who did that, and he thoroughly enjoyed his experience. But access isn't necessarily just about you know, parking or animals or even handicaps. It's literally sometimes economic, and that can be a much larger barrier uh, sometimes when talking about camping equipment, people can find that those barriers uh, can be more difficult to, to overcome because they may have a limited income, which is a shame. So this, op this program gives people the opportunity to experience things that they would never have even thought about experiencing. But that's really about it. Um, if you have any questions, I'm more than willing to talk about it, um, including Angry Moose and uh, or Galveston. Or, in particular, I love this, this program, and I would love to see more people involved with it and spread the word to your friends. Uh, thank you very much, and have a great evening. Thanks and gig'em.